Well, you might uh, then ask yourselves, well, Evans, uh, why are you here? Uh, uh, why did you bring the court's attention to this community? And I, I want to rush to tell you that uh, one of the main reasons I wanted to be here is to let you know that the court system that I represent is your court system. Uh, you elect us. You provide the resources that we have in our courtrooms throughout this county. We work for you. And the solutions that can emanate from uh, the court system are solutions that you might be able to benefit from. And for most people, they don't come to court at all unless they come to traffic court. <laughs> I know no, there are no bad drivers here, so you never come to traffic court, I'm sure, from this community. But many of the people in this community do come to court uh, to deal with traffic court matters. Uh, another area of the law that brings in people from this community domestic relations, uh, divorces, and um, custody battles, and um, debates over property that must be settled as a result of um, domestic relations. Uh, maybe you know about our courts in that way. But I wanted to come here to talk to you about so many other services that we provide for you in your name. And um, you have residents in the community who are here tonight who've worked in some of those systems. Uh, I see uh, Louis back there, uh, for example. Uh, Lou uh, worked with us in domestic violence. And that's an important problem-solving court that we have. Uh, it's a fancy term, but what that means is that um, we had to set aside a separate building, a new court facility, just to handle the number of times that husbands and wives, parents of children, battled each other, abused and hurt each other. And for a long time, we had a system in Chicago where the police would arrive and discover that the people who were at loggerheads with one another were either married or that they had children together and the police officers would leave saying, oh, you all can work it out. And the battering continued. And I would see it in court. Most of the time, it was a female who was being battered by a male. And yes, we had resources for the female, but we didn't have anything to stop the male from battering the female. So the cycle of violence just continued. Well, Louis and others helped us realize that we needed a separate facility so that those who were battered would feel comfortable coming in. And we had to separate the battered individuals from the perpetrators. And that's what we do at one of our court facilities at 555 West Washington. We have a separate place for those who've been victimized. We have a separate place for those who are accused of being victimizers. And uh, we have services for both. We stop the perpetrators from engaging in this activity by letting them know that this is a symptom of not 
just losing their temper, but attempting to control somebody else. Control is at the base of it. And when we, including Lou and others, put the perpetrators through those kinds of um, teaching experiences, we can stop the cycle of violence. And more of the people who are battered will come forward, including some of the men. About 10% of those who are battered are male. And just like the females who came before me as a judge, they'd come in with uh, their arm in a sling. And they'd say, uh, Judge uh, Evans, I I'd like to dismiss this case. And I would say, well, I'm looking at your complaint. You have said what happened to you. Why would you want to dismiss the case? And they'd say, oh, uh, I fell down the steps or uh, somebody bumped into me because they thought that somebody was going to look down on them, that they were going to have to go right back home again with the person who had hurt them and no resources were available for them. What I'm telling you is that we now have resources for you and those like you who are being battered tonight and I'm here to tell you when you get back to your neighborhood, to your friends and to your loved ones, you can tell them that the court system can assist them and they don't have to tolerate what they've been going through. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, these courts are called uh, problem solving courts. Uh, maybe you have heard about jails being overcrowded in uh, Cook County. Anybody heard about that? Yes. Yeah. When um, I became the chief judge some years ago, uh, we had a facility at 26 in California which had a daily population of something in excess of 11,000 people. The facility at 26 in California is built for no more than 10,200 people. So at that time, um, the jails were continuously overcrowded, meaning that people had to sleep on the floor, on carts, in corridors. They were treated inhumanely there. And as bad as that was, taxpayers were paying something like $143 a day to keep them there. Well, one of the things I wanted to tell you is that we now have a new public safety assessment tool to help judges decide who should be released while their case is pending and who should be retained while their case is pending. And we don't leave it up to the judge alone anymore. There was a time when the judge would uh, listen to the prosecutor and the prosecutor would say, Judge Evans, this person was arrested last night and he's a terror to the community. Lock him up, keep him in jail. And the public defender who handles about 90% of these cases would say, no, Judge Evans, uh, let this person go into the community. This person is a member of my uh, Catholic church and uh, he was raised in the church and he's perfectly capable of being a good citizen while his case is pending. Well, of course, how would the judge know who to believe? Impossible. The judge would, oh, I, I, I got a hunch. I, I, I'm looking at this guy and he's looking away and uh, I, maybe he's uh, not somebody I can trust. That is a lousy way of deciding who should be in jail. So what we have embraced in this public safety assessment tool that I'm talking about is a tool that can predict who is likely to come to court when they're supposed to come to court, 
who is likely to commit a crime while their case is pending, and who is likely to commit a violent crime while the case is pending. Using this tool, we no longer have an overcrowded jail. Remember I told you the population was about 11,000 for beds built for 10,000. Now, using this system, the population is under 8,000. You need to know that. Yes, it is using the presumption of innocence for anyone who is arrested, properly so, but it also makes it possible for now the citizens of this city to save $143 a day for more than 3,000 people per day because of the new system that we use. And that's another example of these uh, problem-solving courts that I'm talking about. We have 19 of them spread throughout the community. We have a mental health court, for example. We don't prosecute people who are mentally ill. We give them the help that they need for their mental illness. That's one of our problem-solving courts. We have drug courts uh, that don't prosecute people for being addicted to drugs. We get them rehabilitation instead of prosecuting them uh, in these problem-solving courts. I've talked to you a little bit about domestic violence court, and I won't uh, uh, go through that again, but we have them uh, all over the city, but also them located at 555 West Harrison, a whole building similar to this just for domestic violence. We have a situation where the elders in a community like this need to be protected. Many times they are being abused by their own relatives. So one of our problem-solving courts is called elder law court. And anytime someone is 60 or older going through court, they can get special attention in the elder law courts so that we can be aware of the possibility that somebody is taking advantage of them in our court system. We also have um, problem-solving courts involving sex, prostitution. It's not a very popular um, place to be. And most of the people I know don't want to admit that they know anybody who's involved in prostitution in our community. But I assure you, it happens. Some people are trapped in the sex trade. And um, when I first became chief judge, I would go to some of these prostitution courtrooms and, and I'd hear the prostitutes say this, um, judge, process me as quickly as you can because I have to get back out in the community and work for my pimp. They didn't mind admitting who they were and what they were doing because they had no other place to live, they had no other place to work, and they felt trapped. Well, what we do in prostitution court now is we don't, we don't prosecute the so-called prostitutes, we consider them victims. And we go after the Johns and the pimps who put them into prostitution court. And while they are in prostitution court, the victims receive trauma assistance because they've been traumatized. They also receive job training, get their GED, get on to college. Uh, we get them employment. We then uh, rescue them from that system and ask them to come back and pull others out of the prostitution system. That's another one of our courts that you may not know about. And uh, I hope and trust that 
you will be able to share some of this with your neighbors and your friends. We have veterans courts where veterans are returning from the war in Afghanistan and Iraq and other places. And they're coming back with PTSD. We don't prosecute them. We assist them. We help them as veterans. We treat them like human beings. We treat them like people who put their lives on the line for us. And we have 19 of these systems throughout our Cook County community. And I want you to know if you know a veteran who has returned from the war, male or female, who needs these services, who might be caught up in the court system, please get word to them. We can help them and treat them like the human beings that they deserve to be treated like. We have foreclosure court. We used to have a situation, and I hope nobody here is in the process of uh, losing a home. Or that you don't, uh, let's hope that you don't know anybody who's in the process of losing a home. But if you do, we have a court system that can provide them with services that they don't have access to right now. Most of the people who are losing their homes are ashamed to come down to court and say that. Before we set up foreclosure court, let's say in 2008, we had something like 16,000 people being foreclosed every year. Once 2008 rolled around, instead of 16,000, it went to 52,000 a year. And nine out of 10 people never even came to court. So they lost their property by default. They thought somebody was going to say, hey, didn't you read this document before you sign it? They thought somebody was going to call them names or look down on them. Doesn't happen. That might happen on Judge Judy's show but not in your court where we treat people humanely. And so what we've done in foreclosure court, we knew if they couldn't pay their mortgages, then they couldn't hire a lawyer. So we provide them with free lawyers. We knew that if they couldn't pay their mortgages, they couldn't mediate with the banks. So we provide free mediators for them. They couldn't coordinate their paperwork. They didn't know what uh, a mortgage document was or what the note looked like or what it was supposed to say and do. So we analyzed all of that for them. And so now in foreclosure court, instead of nine out of 10 people losing their property, it's the other way around. Many of them are staying in their property, thousands of them, because they can get the legal services in foreclosure court that they are entitled to. And you need to know it's there for you and there for your friends who might be encountering problems like this. We have um, many other uh, courts, but I want to talk to you about a couple that we are putting together. And we might consider this community for one of them. It's a court that deals with restorative justice, meaning that we don't punish in that court. We try to restore the people in that court. Let me, let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say that you've got some young person who is addicted to drugs. And that person steals a television set from one of your neighbors or maybe steals your television set. In the past, what would happen is that person would be prosecuted and sent to jail. And in jail, they'd uh, become more criminalized. Somebody would say, well, um, 
how did you get arrested? And they'd say, well, I, we stole a television set so we could uh, buy some drugs. They'd say, well, where did you try to sell the television set? They said, well, uh, in Chicago. Well, the cellmate will say, no, don't sell it in Chicago, sell it uh, in Gary. Uh, sell it somewhere else. In other words, they wouldn't be trying to stop them from stealing television sets. They'd be trying to tell them how to get away with stealing television sets. What I'm saying is that in the restorative court that I'm talking about, we would not prosecute the individual who stole the television set. We'd say, no, pal, uh, we're going to get you a job so that you can buy another television set and give that television set back to the person whose television set you stole. And in addition to the money that you will earn for that new television set, you're going to pay for your drug rehabilitation. And once you get rehabilitated, we're not going to give you a record that would keep you from getting scholarships and keep you from getting jobs. We're going to expunge your record. And we're going to give you a fresh start. That's one of the programs I hope we can bring to this community, a community restorative justice court. And I uh, want to let you know that I have been traveling around this community with Margaret to see what might be a good facility for us to use. And uh, I hope we can find one for a community like this. We also uh, are considering a court that would deal with homelessness. Anybody know anybody who sleeps on the street in this neighborhood? Yeah. Well, homelessness is not a crime. Vagrancy is not a crime. What we want to do is find a way to deal with the homelessness so that we help the homeless person, but it doesn't become a problem for the neighborhood, for the community. Uh, and I, uh, I know that you are familiar with the violence that's going on all over Chicago. That we, there used to be a time you could say, well, um, if you don't go into certain neighborhoods, you won't encounter violence. Chicago right now has violence in every neighborhood. And what we want to do is to see what we can do to uh, stop some of that. And we've got some ideas on that, too. Uh, but um, let, me, let me just uh, stop for a moment in talking about these problem-solving courts to say that, um, yes, the court system deals with all of these problems that we've been describing, but your court system does more than work locally. Uh, people who have legal training, like some of the people here, there's Steve Kowski, for example. Raise your hand, Steve. He's a lawyer who um, can help you. But more than that, he has a certain capacity that lawyers have. Uh, they don't just become uh, judges like my colleague and I. Uh, they do many things, and I hope some of the people I, I see here will end up uh, in law school. Uh, many of you here are already studying uh, social studies, I understand. There's a criminal justice uh, commitment at this school. Uh, many of you can use that in law school. And I hope that you will consider that. Because with law school, you can do any number of things. You can help in the community, yeah. But you can also work nationally and internationally. Does anybody know what the profession of uh, the President of the United States is? A lawyer. 
He's the lawyer. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can be president. Uh, does anybody know what profession his wife has? Lawyer. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much.